probably it. So, so Brittany, why don't you uh, jump in there? All right. Well, thank you for that lead up. I think it will go very nicely with um, this topic today. Um, so first, hi, my name is Brittany Lemke, and I'm here to pitch a startup called Centaurus Incorporated. Um, it's based in disaster response, but first, thank you for joining and happy Earth Day. So the first organization I wanted to talk about is Engineers Without Borders. They are a global nonprofit dedicated to helping individuals meet their basic human needs. I worked with them for about six years and they have currently 433 active projects, but more than half of them are based in water infrastructure. And so all of their projects are operated by chapters, either by a university or a professional chapter, and they currently serve over a million users. And that's just EWB USA. There's actually all sorts of different countries that can form their own engineers without borders, and they all have their own um, metrics. But the second chart is specific for disaster response in the United States. And so the emergency management departments are responsible for processing a natural hazard, and they're also responsible for projects implemented in these like four mission areas. And so I, I graduated from school and I moved back to my hometown here in Tampa Bay, which is Hillsborough County. And I have been personally called to action because we are just one of many coastline communities that are particularly vulnerable to climate change effects. And so to approach disaster recovery anywhere, we have to first understand that healthcare and community infrastructure are core products of how we interact with the environment. And so EWB is my inspiration for this startup and they use the PMEL framework for every stage of their projects. And so Centaurus will do the same, but by paying close attention to people, governance, culture, and policy. So for a brief overview of the technical aspects, um, there's two parts to this natural accounting. And so this is ecosystem services, and there are four categories. So Regulating services are services that are a result from processes in nature. So pollinators or carbon sequestration. Provisioning is the raw materials that we use as products. So timber, soil, or solar, water. Um, supporting services are any service that underpins our ecosystem. So basic nutrients and then water cycles or other types of nutrient cycles. And then the last one is cultural services. And so this is the non-material benefit that we receive from our interaction with nature. And so for economics, at least we have recreation and tourism, but there's also a lot of spirituality that comes from these interactions as well. And so on the right side, this is a non-exhaustive list of hazards and each of them has their own origin, their own dynamics, and then their overall impact and variance in how it impacts people. But in addition to the natural accounts considered, there are, well, our way of measuring damage is also reliant on institutional resources, and that's also known as community lifelines. And this is actually a federal emergency management agency term. And so they have seven different categories that they measure um, institutional resources by. And so just to kind of put it all together, this is the framework that Centaurus will use to help every community overcome a natural hazard or also to remediate any environmental hazard. And so this is actually the household livelihood crunch model, and it's 
pretty much the same thing. It's adapted from. The only difference here is that this is the community lifelines and actually that's the only difference. Um, and so hazards are also, hazards and community lifelines are inherent factors for measuring resilience, which is honestly gonna be the best way that we can try to prevent or mitigate or overcome any type of natural disaster. There is though a double burden that's placed on those in poverty. And there's also underlying processes like politics, economics, culture, and our environment that really sway the outcomes of how we receive and respond to a natural disaster. Um, and so the whole purpose is to reduce the vulnerability a community has and then increasing the capacity to overcome a hazard. Um, so thank you, that's pretty much it. But I do just wanna say if you resonate with any of these ideas or if you think that your community or your organization can benefit from this framework or this style of work, then definitely send me an email at centaurusinc at gmail.com or you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, that is about it. I do, if we have extra time, um, I do have a little demonstration for a, a beta application that I worked with, actually with two people from UC Berkeley. So maybe David, you would know them. Hi. Yeah, do we, who, who is it? Um, Haley Wolliver and Sarah Hartman. Don't know them, but yeah. yeah, maybe they might be. We we have some young engineers in our company. We started with the old crew, and now we're beginning to get younger. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're yeah. actually pretty close to the campus, but our our people come from all over the place. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah, they cool. Were yeah great so. People, so. Yeah. Yeah, Brittany, we have we have time for that. And uh, um, I had a question too, although it slipped my mind now. So why don't you do this demo? And if I think of it, I'll, I'll ask you. Yeah. So we actually, we worked on this um, a while ago. So I was a project lead for a um, a project based in Kenya, and it was an agriculture project, but the main part of the project was the irrigation structure. And so the community was relying on a lot of the crops that were coming from the farms, but the code that I actually was able to come up with, they don't, well, it actually does not show any of the river that we were basing the irrigation system off of. And so I can actually. So this is just like a basic image of like the location. And so this is transformed. This takes satellite imagery and transforms it into red, green, and blue. And then you can also do more calculations. And ultimately the purpose was to get a vegetative index. And so it, it is very accurate for the sake of trying to look at the project and seeing where the most agriculture actually is, but it was pretty useless for the concept of the project because it was based on irrigation. And so this river right here, you could actually see its front end here. It does not show up at all on the calculations. And so water is supposed to be identified by that like bright pink and then high vegetative index is by that like really bright green and then anything else is kind of a lower index. Um, but this is a really cool platform. If you've never used Google Earth Engine, I highly recommend it because it's it's really just revolutionary and like what you could do. And so you can overlay all sorts of um, Oh, I think I mix these up. There we go. Okay. So like you can overlay the different types of maps. And so this is the vegetative index on top of the true color image. But it was, again, it was kind of useless for the purpose of our project. But I worked with the two girls from UC Berkeley and we were able to develop 
a different type of application where you kind of go through the steps and so click to start, you put in your coordinates, exactly what your project site is. You can select like the area that you want to look at. So if we want to do like the largest area, then if you just like go through the buttons, it will literally like take you there, draw, you know, a big old square around what you're trying to look at. And then you can continue on by building a new map. And so you can look at satellite images. So like this would be 1985, are you on? Maybe not. Oh, okay, I was just going too fast for it. But... No, that's cool. Um, it's, it's nice to hear someone who's uh, half my age being wowed by technology. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, the question I had for you, and we, we talked about this a little bit uh, um, this week or it was last week, um, is how do you balance like the standardization to make you know different response systems on the local and the state and county and federal level? Um, compatible with each other and so they're speaking the same lingo and all of that verse being tailored to the individual community and the individual community needs um you know so how do, how do you balance that and have you thought about you know maybe ways that you know you can still have something that's fairly standardized and maybe something you know that's more obviously certain things are going to apply to a coastal community rather than a mountain community you know those are different but can you you know, can you can you do it where similar, you know, coastal communities are, are working the same way, or is there still maybe too many little individual things that, that affect each community that, that might have to be dealt with separately? Yeah, so that that really is um the issue at hand. I mean, FEMA, which is the federal agency for emergency management, they kind of set the framework and then the states and the local jurisdictions can kind of play with it or modulate it according to what they need. Um, it's just really hard for communities to get in touch with their governments. It's hard for them to know what resources are available. And also government is very behind on research, I think, in my opinion. And they don't really have a good structure from learning from those implementations either, you know, so if something goes wrong, there's no real like, oh, okay, we're sorry, we did it wrong, but we're gonna correct <laughs> it. And that like, that just is totally taken out of the equation. And so understanding the very minute details of how a community differs from another one is really like where Centaurus is supposed to be like in the middle of. Um, and really just putting all of it together more than just the science, but understanding the people and getting in touch and really knowing what they want and what they think they need versus somebody going in and saying, hey, this is what you need, because that just doesn't always work. Sure. Now, people like to come up with their own solutions. Uh, they don't always like to come up with their own solutions, but they don't like it to be imposed upon them. So they're more apt to to embrace something that they have come up with. Sometimes people are lazy doing that. But if you actually foster, I think, an environment for people to come up with some of their own solutions um, rather than imposing it from the outside. And, and I think that maybe is a lesson for us to learn in the in the whole climate space and environmental space, you know, because um, going back to Kel, you know, he was pretty optimistic that humans could solve things and, and we've solved some ma amazing things and we've responded quickly to some amazing things and we've dedicated resources to some things and, and solved them and like so quickly, in fact, or, or, or so, so seamlessly to, to the public that the public thought the original problem was a hoax, like, like Y2K or something, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, from an engineering standpoint, a computer code standpoint, it's very easy to see that, you know, zero, zero could be 20, you know, to the year 2000 or the year 1900. And it's, it's hard for the program to know which way to go or, or it's gonna go the wrong way. Um, you know, it's a very, it's a fairly simple problem, but we spent billions solving that. 
And because, you know, millions and millions of lines of computer code had to be had changed from zero, zero to two, zero, 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 you know, and uh, yet, you know, the planes didn't fall out of the sky. You're probably a, a little young to remember that. But, uh, you know, people were worried. Are planes going to fall out of the sky? Is the electrical grid going to stop working? You know, all these problems that we, you know, that, that were predicted didn't happen. And I think that's part of the reason why we're having a tough time with climate is because there's been predictions and, and it doesn't happen tomorrow. And, and now there's some of them are starting to happen a little bit, but already people have kind of made up their mind and they don't have the mental fluidity to look at the new evidence coming in and, and the collective agreement among top scientists, thousands of top scientists, so they don't want to change their mind and say, oh, yeah, maybe I was wrong. Uh, you know, politicians don't want to look wishy-washy. They don't want to admit they're wrong. You know, so I think a lot of that, you know, makes it a little harder for us. But I think if we figure out how to have a bit of a paradigm shift you know, when we finally do, I think we can actually take some quick action. We did it with like the ozone hole layer, you know, the hole in the ozone layer that was, you know, we banned those aerosols and, and took quick action. I think Cal would like to see that. And I, I kind of agree with him on the fossil fuels. I mean, I do think we have to, we're so interdependent on it. It's, you can't just ban them tomorrow, but uh, you, you don't want to be, ex, you know, don't, 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 don't want to be doing new exploration either. So um, cool. Does anyone else have any questions for Brittany? Um, very nice presentation. You, you, uh, I like the way you. Uh, I think you landed nicely in the middle. You know, from uh, the, the, you know, what you had presented me before, which was good. You know, you kind of combined the best elements of both of them. So congrats on that. Thank you.